Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today grew up an only child of parents whose stories describe their escape from communist Hungary and his father's tragic history of escaping the Nazis twice having his own parents taken to Auschwitz, inspired my guest to document his parents' experiences and share them with Jewish groups and others throughout the United States. Not a Real Enemy shares his family saga and the forgotten history of the nearly half million Hungarian Jews who were deported and killed during the Holocaust. His book is an epic and inspiring tale of daring escapes, terrifying oppression, tragedy, and triumph. Welcome to Authors Over 50, Dr. Robert Wolf. Hi, Julia. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, it's nice to see you, and thanks again for uh, letting me on your show. Robert, our opening question on Authors Over 50 is always, what took you so long to write your first book? Well, there's a million answers to that, so I'm going to try to keep them simple. One thing is I'm a radiologist. I was born and raised in Michigan, uh, K through 12, then went to college, then med school. Then I did a radiology, an internship and radiology residency and a neuroradiology fellowship, all at wonderful institutions including University of Michigan, which I got a shout out for winning the national championship. Hey, go blue. <laughs> so that's where I went to medical school. And then Brown and Yale, I was very fortunate to do all that. Well, that's about 30 years. I mean, that's 30 years of my lifetime. You're pretty much an indentured servant until you're about 30. And then add another 30 years of career work in radiology, the first 12 or so full time. And then I moved back to part time. I read my dad's story. They wrote it as an autobiography back in the 70s. Uh, paper and pencil to computer to a disc uh, uh, to a, a little manuscript that I didn't think much of at the time. Now we're talking 30 years ago, but I did read it once. And uh, the one thing I remembered was his first escape out of several. He's had four total and there are other adventures uh, that are outside of escape uh, situations, but uh, including a failed attack or a missed escape, that kind of thing, but without saying too much. Um, anyway, so this is 1970s. They wrote the story as though it happened the day before. They wrote it; uh, it, it was crisp, it was clear. The description, the descriptors were uh, were very vivid, very vibrant. And uh, so, flash forward now. So uh, now it's 1997 when my dad passes away. Unfortunately, I'm still in my with my family and my career. Uh, we sat shiva, but I kind of had to move on with my life. Didn't think much of it. My mom and dad were Holocaust educators throughout their lives. Maybe I got a little bit of saturation from that in the first part of my life. But uh, later, it came to be more important to my mom. She was a participant in the Shoah movie, uh, the Spielberg uh, interviewing uh, all of the uh, survivors. So that was wonderful. Um, so 97, my dad passes away. 2016, my mom passes away. So then I spent another year taking care of my mom's affairs. Uh, she wasn't the Queen of England, but she had a lot of complicated affairs like uh, closing out restitution accounts from Germany and Hungary. So she didn't get a lot of money uh, as a restitution for being a survivor, but she got some. And she was very proud of that. So uh, but uh, so she was getting these monthly little checks or quarterly checks. But that was tough to close down in outside countries and selling a house and selling a car. And then I decided to actually uh, retire. Um for a year. But when my mom passed, a historian friend of ours, Kim Parr, uh, from my mom's hometown, uh, I met her at my mom's funeral. She handed me the disc now of my dad's story. So 
And I still didn't think much of it, you know, too much of it then. And But then a couple of years later, I, I was pulled out of retirement by a friend. I'm back to working uh, part time out of Michigan from home here in Florida. And uh, I'm doing ultrasound and x-ray now. And uh, that brought me to the disc. So the disc sort of summoned me. So as a radiologist, we read on two screens. We read the left screen is the cue, is the patient work list, and the right screen are the images. So in between cases, I loaded up my dad's disc, and the left, the left screen was his autobiography, and the right screen was my uh, version of the autobiography turned into a biography. And uh, that was a year's project. And uh, then, so it's, now it's finally done, 2019, and I started querying agents and, and publishers and with little success because it was just sort of point A to point B to point C. It was sort of just a dry biography. And through the channels and beta reads, uh, eventually I found uh, Janice Harper, my co-author. And uh, she's an experienced writer. She's a PhD. Uh, she's an amazing, amazing person, amazing book coach. And she took on the project with me. And that was another year and change. And then she helped me. And then she helped me um, uh, with the querying process. Uh, she did my, my proposal package. She helped me put that together and different letters. And uh, she uh, earmarked. She vetted out very carefully the agents and publishers for us to query. So she got us down to about 10 or 12. We were lucky to get Amsterdam Publishers, literally the last the last one, um, shoestring catch, bottom of the ninth, the best way I can say it. And thank you for uh, Lisbeth Hink and the Amsterdam Publishers who took us on last January, February. And then we released the book late last year in, in uh, October 19, or sorry, 2022. Uh, so, so I guess technically I started the book in 2018, so I was already 56 and I'm 61 now. So it's been a five year project and counting. Uh, it's never too late. It's, you know, I, I, that's one thing. I mean, the material was there and I was motivated to do that just by reading the story again and seeing that the idea of anti-Semitism and persecution in the background was self-motivating. And you get the you get the lessons right away. But then story after story about survival, the miracles, the determination, the integrity, it's it's unreal. So I thought to myself, I have to share this book with the world. And here we go. So it's been a great uh, been well received. We've won four awards already. I don't even know what that means. I mean, I haven't even been able to absorb that. Uh, but it does mean that people are recognizing our work as important and our work as quality. And uh, I hope that uh, that uh, that part of it helps pe helps uh, uh, convince people that they should read more books like ours to educate about anti-Semitism, and especially now with everything going on, even more so. What a wonderful legacy project! I wish that your parents could have lived to see it. Uh, me too. I mean, that, that is a regret. There's no doubt that uh, I, the motivation wasn't there. And the, the distractions and, you know, you're working full time and night call and weekends. Uh, but a lot of my friends and people that are that know my parents and, and know how great they were and, and jovial and jolly and no sign of PTSD. And uh, they they think that my parents are proud of me looking down from the heavens. And uh, my mom with her Jewish guilt, I always have to imitate her. I say to I say, uh, Robbie, you couldn't write that while we were still alive. <laughs> And uh, so that's my own personal joke, and I can hear her saying it, but there it is, Mom. It's out there, and uh, the best you can do. I mean, you, you, and now people are telling me to write more books. I've got two or three more in my head, but I'm still working on this one because I think even if I wrote other books, by far this one would be my most important project uh, with the lessons in it and trying to fight off the racism and anti-Semitism uh, tide that's uh, not only here in the United States, but also Canada and other countries, of course, Israel, uh, Europe. It's not a pretty scene right now. So, well, you know, so many of our parents didn't share their worst experiences with their children. And your parents were so far ahead of their time and especially to to write out their their experiences. Did they ever talk to you or share with you or did you just discover all of this when you received that disc? Well, that's a great question. Uh, they did talk about bits and pieces. Uh, my dad. My dad would lecture me when I would be in my spoiled mode or my, I was just being an American. I'm a spoiled American kid. I mean, I'm, I work hard, but uh, I have it so good growing up that my dad has to keep reminding me how bad things were back in the forced labor camp and with his parents being taken away and with my mom having to hide and, and many, many other friends and family perishing. And uh, so this, uh, this sense of um, 
entitlement is the word I'm looking for, the sense of entitlement that we have as Americans. My dad would always, uh, he would always quench that and, and say, you should be happy that you have food and nobody's bothering, nobody's bothering you, he would say. And, uh, but they did teach about it. They taught their friends, other people. They were very active in the Jewish community. They were active in the local medical community. My dad became an OBGYN, by the way, and delivered 10,000 babies in the Detroit area, which is redemption and what a punchline that is. Um, I wasn't crazy about OBGYN, so I went into radiology, but he loved his work and he would have worked till the day he died, walked in and out of the hospital with smiles, said hi to everybody, the secretaries, the janitors, loved his patients, loved his work. And I, I that was a motivator for me as, as far as going to, into medicine. Uh, the book was just the motivator, was just the, the wording. And, and no, I didn't think much of it as far as getting it out. But yes, um, most of the material that I've learned in detail about their lives, their histories from my, when my dad's childhood in the 20s even slips back into World War One a little bit about his parents, not much, but it's in there all the way to the end of 1956. My dad's memoirs, he wrote out all the way out into the 1970s uh, when they started traveling to the Far East, but that would be book two. It's got its own adventure, but it's not quite the same as this. It'd be a shorter book, but this book's got a lot more uh, more kick to it and more, a lot more meaning and, and salient. So, so we've got that on the autobiography. That'd be one. And then couple other books I'd write on my own, maybe semi-autobiography, a little bit of comedy, a little of, uh, you know, the house of God to it, you know, the, the humorous book that was written uh, many, many years ago that the uh, interns and med students used to love because it was so cynical. So it wouldn't be all of that. But uh, so those are the books I have in my mind. But this one to me is the one that's most important. I think it's got the lessons. I think it's got the message. And uh, it's just a fantastic story. It's just one after one, after another, after another. So well, it sounds like it's a real love story from a fortunate son to his wonderful parents. It's indeed a legacy to my parents, uh, their, their family, my dad's parents, uh, rest in peace, the grandparents I never met. Uh, this, this is my contribution to society. I mean, I've been a doctor that's helping people, but I've always been compensated for it. Uh, other than helping to run a charity event, a fundraising event for kids with cancer back a few years ago, which was a great uh, experience and, and a few, then other than that, this to me is uh, one of the most important things hopefully I'll do in my life and hopefully get the message out to a lot of people so that uh, they can educate their kids, get some books into the classroom, which is uh, ultimately my, my goal. Uh, I don't know about junior high, but some high school selected classes in college. And we're going to work on that slowly, get the message out to professors and hopefully get more lectures and podcasts like this. Uh, I've got a lot of book talks lined up at uh, synagogues and uh, Holocaust museums. And hopefully more coming. And that's my end of it. That's the best I can do is educate. I can't speak for all every survivor and, and uh, the people, all the people that uh, that perished and suffered. But they all have a story. They all have a book, probably. And uh, I, I can't stress that enough for authors that are over 50. If you've got some material, especially about your family and, and it, it teaches a lesson or it's got some twist and turn to it or something, then go ahead and write the book and get some help. It's possible. Anything's possible. And you're doing your part. And you're making a difference in the world by educating. And I think that's that's so significant today. It certainly is. I mean, I would normally educate about radiology and anatomy and science and math because that's my specialty. But in this in this part of it, you know, not a lot of people knew about Hungary necessarily I mean, in World War II, even the Hungarian Revolution. I mean, historians do some select historians, but the general public, not so much. And when we hear these World War II stories about Germany and England and France, Normandy, Belgium, the Pacific, uh, Pearl Harbor, we, we know Okinawa, we know some of these stories, but, but we don't know about what happened in Hungary, the Czech Republic. Uh, Poland is even more notorious. Unfortunately, the Polish people got really hit hard. Uh, and there's a little bit about Poland in the book, too, because uh, the early refugees came from Poland into Hungary and they got turned back and it just didn't end well for them. And it's really a really sad story. Uh, you know, land for people deals uh, just that, that doesn't seem to work out either. So ugly times. You know, I hope we don't come back to that. I mean, Ukraine is tough. Israel's tough. America still, we have a semblance of normalcy for the majority of us, it seems. But there's just things like the, that October 7th attack, you know, that just tips people over the edge. And now my slippery slope has become more slippery. It's just uh, it's like trying to climb a, a mountain with an ice pick. Oh, it's just difficult. So, but we're going to do it. I mean, one book at a time, one talk at a time, uh, one interested human at a time. Some of the, the most extreme people were never going to change their minds. But if we can keep the vast majority of people in so, some sort of harmony and and, uh, and composure and continuity, then I think uh, 
I think that it'll work. So I'm for peace. Amen to that. What does your title mean? Okay, so the book is called, the, the complete title is called uh, Not a Real Enemy, The True Story of a Hungarian Jewish Man's Fight for Freedom. We've got the four awards there, which you're very proud and very blessed and honored. Not a Real Enemy was the arrogant, uh, the arrogant communists, the Russians described my dad in his dossier that he found in the medical center the night before his final escape after the Hungarian Revolution in 1956. My dad wanted to review his dossier uh, to make sure there was no uh, nothing on his head. There was no uh, uh, nothing that nobody had anything on him that uh, he because so he would have met he wouldn't be arrested if he was caught trying to escape. And uh, they, they described him as not a real enemy, neutral towards communism, not a communist sympathizer, just a man who who minded his own business and practiced medicine. Well, my dad gets to read this thing because he sneaks into the medical staff office between security guards. So this isn't, he can't just walk in. So he does this at night, the night before. By now, his tolerance is uh, tolerance level is so high that <laughs> the risk that he takes to do that, it doesn't even bother because he could have been arrested just for that. So not a real enemy is the way they describe him. And in the end, the irony is they were a real enemy. My mom and dad loved the Hungarian government, not the Nazi Hungarian government, not the communist Hungarian government. They hated it all. So when it was time for them to leave, they lost two good people. My mom was 13 months away from graduating medical school. She also ran the blood bank. Uh, she was a front runner during the Hung uh, a front liner during the Hungarian Revolution, running the blood bank. And my dad was uh, doubling down as a trauma surgeon and his OBGYN practice. So he was literally working 24 seven for two two weeks and change. And by then they said enough was enough, and it was time for them to go. So he wanted to review his his. Uh, uh, so they hated the Nazis and, and the communists, and, the, and that country lost two good people. So in the end, they were real enemies. They just were quiet about it. No fisticuffs, guns, or knives, but secretly they didn't conform to the to the demands. Uh, they had their own Jewish wedding, which is an uh, unbelievably interesting chapter, and very sad. Uh, it's happy, but it's sad. And they just wanted to live free and, and practice medicine in a free country. So unfortunately, my mom never went back to med school. She was 13 months away. Uh, that was the United States life. She had to work. She worked in research at the Beth Israel in Boston, the esteemed Beth Israel. When my dad did his residency, I don't even know how he got in back then in the 50s, but he did because now I couldn't even get, forget, I don't even apply to the Harvard. Well, I'm 61, but if, you know, even if I were applying now for a radiology residency or a OBGYN or psychiatry, whatever, it'd be a very, very competitive place, you know, so and fortunate to get in and finished his residency and moved to Detroit where the job market was hopping then in the sixties. So pre-riot era. So, and then they stayed in Michigan actually the rest of their lives. Uh, so until I sold my mom's house. Did he go to medical school in Hungary? He did in Budapest. Yes. In fact, he couldn't go because he was Jewish. In fact, he got kicked out of high school for a while because he was Jewish and off the high school swim team because he was Jewish. So, and he was a good swimmer. Uh, as was I, actually. I, I guess I inherited that from him, and he was a pretty good runner, as you'll see in the book. But so I've, you know, I've, got, I've gotten a little bit of that kind of raw athleticism from my dad. But he was doing it out of survival. But uh, medical school was the same thing, uh, and even his dad uh, was fired from a government practice, uh, a government-related practice, uh, when you know when Jews were beginning uh, to be persecuted in Hungary. And uh, so it took a while before my dad uh, got in. But after World War II, there was such a shortage of doctors. Because of the deaths and and the uh, the refugees and whatever else that they had a short they needed some people into medical school so they allowed Jewish people to return to medical school with a ten percent quota I might add so this is under the communists it's unbelievable how and the communists the way this, they just talk about the Jewish plight you know factories and farms what do we do with all these people a lot of professionals ended up uh, going from white collar to blue collar work just because that's where the they had nowhere to put these people, uh, you know, the, the people that survived, like my dad, from forced labor camps or uh, whatever it was. I mean, and people that survived, of course, the uh, concentration camps. And those people, of course, needed medical attention. And it took months for that from, to recover from that war. And, of course, the uh, the Hungarian Revolution, too. So, But my parents had nothing to do with it at that point. They're just enough is enough. <laughs> Did the U.S. recognize the the uh, medical school he had been attending in Hungary, or did he have to start all over? Well, he did have to redo his residency. So the, they, he graduated, and, and I, I'm not sure if he took board. He did take boards, and he passed them. That's a great story, too. They're a car flipping over in Maine in a snowstorm, <laughs> and his partner with him in the car smoking a cigarette, and the police 
<laughs> it's a great story. <laughs> but anyway, no, he had to redo his residency, and that was uh, he didn't have to go to medical school again, but he had to redo his OBGYN residency while he had to learn the uh, English language. So he was taking high school English or elementary school English in some cases while doing his uh, residency. So he, he was busy, busy. Uh, but then, yeah, once he did that and passed his boards, he was allowed to practice OBGYN, which he was very proud of and very good at it, too. Uh, he, he let me go in and watch him uh, do a surgery once when I was in high school, which was pretty cool. Uh, not even pre-med yet. I was still in high school. So uh, so that was. Uh, but, yeah, it's a long track. I mean, I don't I, most of us couldn't do it. I don't even know if I could do what they went through and survive and, and be able to talk about it. With no, a smile. And, and it's just amazing to me that. The U.S. doesn't recognize a lot of people's advanced degrees. I know some women here in in Texas who fled Ukraine, and they were attorneys and dentists, and they're they're working at Walmart, you know. And it's just so sad. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard. I mean, things have changed. I mean, the immigration problem that we have in this country is is probably a big part of it. Very competitive. Uh, I, I don't want to get political about it, but if it's a problem, it's a problem. If we've got people pouring into uh, in Florida, we have thousand people a day moving down here. So three hundred sixty five thousand. Look, if they can for, afford to be down here, the food, clothing, shelter, transportation, taxes, insurances. I mean, God bless you. But there's you know that that actually eventually creates uh, joblessness and homelessness and crime, unfortunately. So my parents uh, were lucky. They did. They went the route they were supposed to. They got their citizenship. Uh, they had me. I'm the only child. I was lucky to be around. I'm a lucky to be around. My parents were lucky to make it. Uh, and then that's the appreciation I've gotten out of the book. And that's why I really wanted to share it. So. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about the passage you've brought to share today and then read so we can hear your tone and voice. OK, we're still working on an audio book, so but we're not in a rush to do that. So I'm going to get a professional to do that. But this is a part of my speech that I do when I when I tour around uh, for book talks. Uh, uh, Maybe you can get an off uh, a narrator with your mother's accent to read it. That would be wonderful. It would, but uh, I, I've got to, I'm a jury of three. My co-author and my publisher have to decide that they like if we're going to spend the money and, and get. And we we're auditioning. We we're actively doing it. They both kind of agree we prefer an American male voice, but we are going to be auditioning a, a gentleman from uh, Britain who my co-author is is uh, hell bent on at least uh, getting him an audition. So we'll see. So a woman uh, narrated, probably not as much, but a, a male a, a narrator, but they're against the Hungarian accent because my publisher actually listened to a couple of those audiobooks and said the one was a Polish or something. I think she said, and she just didn't like the way it sounded. So, um, but yeah, of course, you know, the book is a biography of my, my dad. It's a history book of Hungary from World War One to the end of 1956, the Hungarian Revolution. It's a saga about my dad's family and, and the adventures. And uh, it brings a lot of emotion out in me, like... Uh, talking about determination and hope and integrity and all of that uh, I've, I've uh, molded into this uh, speech, about a 50 minute speech. And I include a few uh, passages from the book and I just want to see what category. So this is under integrity and uh, it's a little passage uh, uh, after my, my dad uh, was uh, had escaped and was just kind of walking around the streets with his friend. And uh, here we go. As they reached the town center, the men noticed masses of marching military columns occasionally interrupted by armored trucks or horse-drawn wagons. The striking difference between the two, one a symbol of power and might and igniting fear in the hearts of the men, the other a symbol of simplicity and self-reliance, conjuring peace and safety, if not a world before the war, caused the men to reassess whether they ought to be so bold as to approach anyone at all. The alternative is we become thieves just to eat, Irvin said, and I'd rather bank on people having a good heart than darkening my own. I'm with you, Frank said, as he was a man of integrity himself. But we need to be careful. Agreed, Irvin said, just as a couple of well-dressed men came out of a building they were passing. Good afternoon, soldiers, one of the men said, tipping his hat. The other did the same, and no sooner had Irvin and Frank returned the greeting than one of the men asked, what brings you to our town? We don't have many so soldiers out here other than those trucks and tanks that pass us by. Irvin gave them their cover story, which promptly brought more questioning. The more he answered the questions... Frank stepping back and keeping conspicuously quiet so as not to contradict or confuse the explanation, the more nervous Irvin became. What had become a friendly greeting was quickly advancing to a suspicious interrogation. Look, the man, the more vocal one said, in a lowered tone, stepping away from the street and closer to the building as if it were a safer place to be, away from the passers-by. No one gets lost out here. You're Jews, and you've made a run for it. That's just chilling to me. 
So they, as many as there were so many people that were so nasty with the Jewish people, but the luck that my dad had, the people that he happened to encounter in whatever circle he was in, they, I mean, some were tough on him and no different than others, but some were actually, there was some acts of kindness, uh, priests, uh, some other refugees, Hungarian Jewish refugee, refugees in Budapest. Every chapter has got its own little stories like, wow, wow, wow. Hiding places you wouldn't expect, cloak and dagger stories, arguing with armed Russian soldiers, twists and turns, the people that you thought would be friends end up being enemies, the people that thought you'd be your enemies end up being your friends. It's just unbelievable. And you just, it's, a, it's a head scratcher that uh, my dad was lucky to be here. And, and uh, integrity was a pretty big part of it. They had to have integrity. They had to have honesty. They shared their food. Food was always scarce. That was shared. And, and my dad was put in charge of uh, rationing the food when, if they were lucky enough to have a little extra sent from home or, or from the peasants, uh, the neighboring peasants when they were out in forced labor camp in the middle of nowhere. So it's, uh, it's good behavior, but it's also luck, belief in God, hope. And uh, I don't know, I like to say the love of God, the finger of God, whatever it guided them through. And especially with everything in the world around them crumbling down. And I think about that, too. I think about what if all of that was happening here and where we live? Would we be the strong ones to act out our character? Would we be able to help others or would we just turn our, our face away? You know, I always think about that. Oh, I'm doing my part. I'm, I'm, I'm sticking my neck out like a turtle. I, I'm, I'm not into death and, and torture and malfeasance. I'm into peace and love, uh, productivity. Uh, I heard along this journey that someone once said on a social media site that the human race has put us back 400 years with all our malfeasance between wars and pestilence like the COVID and the flu and uh, terrorism. We've, we're 400 years behind where we should be technologically and I kind of see that. I mean, we're we're now we have to fight our, our other our other countries. We have to worry about our own defense. We got to worry about immigrants, illegal immigrants, criminals, now terrorists, and uh, reigniting this uh, racism and anti-Semitism theme. So uh, no, I I mean somebody's around me. I'm I'm going to stand up to them. I mean, I've already. If you know about my book, you might be coming after me. But uh, the book's out there. You're not. I, I'm no MLK. I'm no Gandhi. But I got a message that's just as important, and that is about peace and equality and some semblance of normalcy. Um, most people I know, Jewish or Christian, I have a lot of both. i got more Christian friends than Jewish. Muslim too, Buddhist. They're hard workers. They're productive. They care about people. They do their jobs. They care about their family. And I'd like to think that's 98%, 99% of our population overall, and I hope it stays that way because it is a good point. The last thing we need is anarchy, and uh, I'm not big into that, and I've posted that many times. Yeah, well, from your lips. Was there anything that you edited out of your book that was in your father's, your parents' story, but that you didn't include in your own book? Very little. So if dad said that that's what happened, then that's what happened. But we did have the book. Uh, we've, we've had the book Beta Red, excuse me. Uh, we had a retired historian from the Holocaust Museum in D.C. review the book, uh, edited it, and we made our changes accordingly. Uh, we had uh, three wonderful testimonials, one of which was Michael Berenbaum, who was a he was a consultant to Steven Spielberg in that show, a movie. He's a, an expert in out in California. And he actually wrote one of the very, very nice testimonials. And he had a few changes to make. He tweaked because he'd been to Auschwitz and he knew all about the history. So we had to tweak the story a little bit there uh, that he's on his suggestion. And also from our, uh, our historian friend. He had about two pages or three pages of changes. Some things we deleted. We some things we made more clarified, and uh, and the conversation was a little. So the conversation was a little bit embellished. So it makes it more of a. And this is where Janice comes in, my co-author. It's uh, it makes it more of a book. It makes it more of a novel, a story. Letters to and from home, conversations, uh, parallel stories, converging stories. It makes it uh, a lot more um, a lot more uh, exciting. A lot yeah. more. It's just uh, it's a fantastic thing. So. Well, that's what Americans want. You know, we want to be able to see in our mind this movie playing in front of us. And so all of those stories and and embellishments probably make that, you know, a stronger story. Everything in there, though, is what is it came from what my dad and mom had experienced. So it's not like we didn't make things up. We didn't add we didn't add any Superman stories, but we did. The com the conversations were real and, and the way my dad described and not only discussions and conversations, smells, sights, sounds, experiences, you, you feel them. I mean, when you're in my dad's shoes, especially when he's escaping or whatever, or whatever, 
you, you could feel it. And that's that's what got me motivated too about the book because that you, you could actually feel that uh, you could empathize completely with them and say, this could be me. I, I'm, a, I'm a spoiled American. It could be me. I mean, I, I don't know how I would do this. Survival, survival. And when you don't have a choice, you don't have a choice. And God forbid, most of us don't have to go through that in our lifetime. And I hope it stays that way. Well, Robert, this has been a great visit today. And your book is certainly a very significant one. As always, our last interview question is, our writers over 50 are unique. Do you have advice for writers 50 and above? Never too late. I've sort of said that once. Uh, it's never too late to pivot. If, you doing, if you're doing a job that you're not crazy about and you want to do something, a little side hustle, and I'm not saying that most authors probably aren't going to make a lot of money on their books, but if it's something, a project that you feel strongly about, if you want to do your family legacy, uh, if you want to pivot into something else, write a play, write an opera, travel more, find another hobby that you like, sports or a theater, the arts, or write a book, write, write a play, like I said, and uh, stay with it. it it's, a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, listen to people, take advice. If you've got a little money to spend to get help, uh, you, you should get a copy editor, of course, and you should get beta readers, and then you need testimonials. And for me, I, I learned a ton, go into it with an open mind, because I learned a ton in the last four or five years, marketing, English, uh, history, uh, writing, the whole process of it is, it's not easy. It's, it's a very difficult, uh, very, uh, it's, it's a very tedious sometimes process, but it's heartfelt in my case. And if you have a heartfelt story, survivor or otherwise, uh, it, tell it, I mean, share it. Uh, if you want to get help, like I said, get help. Um, don't be bored in life. And, and I, we all should have accountability. Don't, don't be angry at me because I'm Jewish. Cause you know, my dad was a doctor. I'm a doctor. I'm productive. You know, I'm, I'm not a criminal. Uh, I, I pay my taxes. I, I, we tip the, I tip the waiters. Great. I take care of people. We double down at Christmas. Uh, I celebrate Christmas and new year or, and Hanukkah. And my, uh, my ex-wife and I, we celebrated with that and Passover and Easter. We showed a lot of tolerance, uh, integrated really well with their family. And uh, it's still a big part of their, their family, too. They all support the book. Two kids, three grandkids, two have already been to the Holocaust Museum, taking pictures, holding the book. I'm in talks right now with the Holocaust Museum in, in D.C. And I hope I uh, get a, a book uh, signing or talk there soon, since the book has been on the shelves there for quite a while. Talk to the Illinois Holocaust Museum. And that those are things that uh, you need to do to help promote your book, too. So it's not just write the book, hand it to an agent or a publisher and collect royalties. You need to work at marketing. If you can't hire somebody, which can be expensive, it can be less expensive. If you if you vet it out right, you got to do some of it yourself. And uh, and so if you're not prepared to do that, then if you just want the book out and a few people to read it, then that's the case. But uh, I want this book to be successful. And it's it's the, not just because it's my dad's story, but also the let you know the, the lessons in it and they're there nobody's going to be bored with this book it's very exciting it's very thought-provoking humbling and for even for me a game changer i mean it's going to get people to change their minds about what's going on and including me well you mentioned the word tolerance and i think that's what we all have to strive for you know is is tolerance with our our human kind and to be um, peaceful human beings and to show kindness. If we all believe in a higher power, you know, that's, that's pretty much demanded of us. And so I hope that we can all walk that path. And I just appreciate your worthwhile project. You're sharing your parents' incredible story, and I know it's going to influence and affect so many people. So thank you so much for being with us today, and we're excited to now count you among our authors over 50. Thank you for uh, inviting me, and I just want to say that if somebody's interested in buying a copy of Not a Real Enemy, then they can find, well, they can find more about me and the book uh, on my uh, website, where it's uh, robertjwolfmd.com. But Not a Real Enemy is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, either by online or go ask at your local store, Walmart, and uh, now at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in D.C. and the Illinois Holocaust Museum and uh, my public library from my hometown and on and on and on. There's going to be more, hopefully, uh, coming soon. So, And I appreciate the recognition and people's support. Well, blessings on you and your project. Thank you. A proud pleasure meeting you. Thank you for the interview. Thank you for joining us today. Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. 
please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like dailynewspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third.